This is the final video of the series I'm making on the Odes of John Keats, based on the book of the same name by Helen Venler. I'm trying to make each so that they can stand alone, but I would recommend watching the others to get a fuller picture. All of the views I describe in these videos are Venler's, except where I note otherwise. This video is about the ode titled To Autumn, which by Venler's reckoning is the last of the six odes to be composed. John Keats wrote all the odes in the year 1819, just two years before his death from tuberculosis at the age 25. With this particular ode, we actually know the date it was composed, because Keats wrote about it to his friend John Hamilton Reynolds. We'll see some of this letter later. Throughout the series of odes, the poet's conception of life and art matures until it reaches full ripeness in the magnificent ode to the season of harvest. Here the poet comes to fully affirm the reality of process, which includes death, and finally finds a poetic language which unites sensation and thought, beauty and truth. This is generally considered one of the finest short poems in the English language, and this certainly appears to be Venla's view as well. For her, it excels all of Keats' other odes, it is their culmination. It is, as far as a poem can be, perfect. I'll read the poem before describing Venla's analysis of it. For this, each stanza has its own slide. Here it is. Season of mists and mellow fruitfulness, close bosom friend of the maturing sun, conspiring with him how to load and bless with fruit the vines that round the thatch eaves run, to bend with apples the mossed cottage trees and fill all fruit with ripeness to the core, to swell the gourd and plump the hazel shells with a sweet kernel, to set budding more and still more later flowers for the bees, until they think warm days will never cease, for summer has o'brimmed their clammy cells. Who hath not seen thee oft amid thy store? Sometimes whoever seeks abroad may find thee sitting careless on a granary floor, thy hair soft lifted by the winnowing wind, or on a half-reaped furrow, sound asleep, drowsed with the fume of poppies, while thy hook spares the neck swathe and all its twined flowers. And sometimes, like a gleaner, thou dost keep steady thy laden head across a brook, or by a cider press, with patient look, thou watchest the last oozings, hours by hours. Where are the songs of spring? Ay, where are they? Think not of them, thou hast thy music too, While barred clouds bloom the soft dying day, And touch the stubble plains with rosy hue. Then in a wailful choir the small gnats mourn Among the river sallows, borne aloft or sinking, As the light wind lives or dies and full-grown lambs loud bleat from hilly bourne. Hedge crickets sing, and now with treble soft, the red breast whistles from a garden croft, and gathering swallows twitter in the skies. The odes take up different attitudes towards the senses. Venla calls them a series of controlled experiments in the suppression or permission of sense experience. For instance, Nightingale was focused on sound, Grecian urn on vision. The ode immediately before this one, the ode on melancholy, admitted the lower senses of touch and taste, although there is a certain strain in that poem, as the poet, in the face of melancholy, seizes his mistress' hand and feeds upon her eyes. In the ode to autumn, all five senses are brought effortlessly and harmoniously into play. Here I should note that, in Venla's book, she devotes a chapter to the two epic Hyperion poems Keats began about the fall of the Titans, but never completed. According to Venla, he wrote the latter of these, titled The Fall of Hyperion, after the other odes but before the Ode to Autumn. In the book, Venla uses these two other poems to better map the progress of his poetry and thought, 
though I've left them out of this video series on the odes as they're mostly not essential. And besides, if you're interested, this may serve as an additional impetus to get the book. The odes are a gradual progression towards embracing the reality of process, which was denied in the Ode to Psyche, evaded in, Ode to, in the Ode to a Nightingale, grudgingly and implicitly accepted in the Ode on a Grecian Urn, and actively and explicitly pursued in the Ode on Melancholy. Here, in the Ode to Autumn, a poem addressed to a season, to something that is transient by its very definition, here a complete and unstrained affirmation of process is found. At the same time, the Odes are a progression towards integrating beauty and truth, an aspiration announced in the Ode on a Grecian Urn in those famous yet mysterious lines, Beauty is truth, truth beauty, that is all ye know on earth and all ye need to know. As I indicated in my video on that Ode, though the poem announces the identity of beauty and truth, it doesn't exactly embody it. Instead, it oscillates between them. Even these lines themselves speak against their identity, filled as they are with propositional language, the truth of thought rather than the beauty of sensation. But Keats wants to find the two united, wants to find a way to express thought with sensation. In To Autumn, he achieves this by stationing beauty truly. I know that's bound to sound cryptic right now, but you'll get a sense of it in action as I go through Wendler's analysis of the poem, and I'll explain it explicitly at the end of my video. Let's start with the overall structure. According to Wendler, there are five large structural movements, simultaneous with each other, interweaving and stretching through the whole of the poem. The first of these is a temporal one, the progress of the season from the late summer and early autumn of the first stanzas, flowers, bees, and ripening fruit, through the central autumn imagery of harvest in the second stanza, to the stripped fields and gathering birds on the verge of winter in the final stanza. The second large movement is spatial, as though the whole poem was set in a particular farm, beginning in the central thatched cottage and surrounding trees and beehive of the first stanza, it expands outward to the wheat fields, granary and cider press of the second stanza. Finally, in the third stanza, it reaches the utmost boundaries of the farm, its natural borders, the river, the hills and the hedgerows, and beyond even these, in the end, to the sky where the swallows are gathering. The third movement represents the progress of a day, from the mists of dawn in the first stanza, through the midday heat in which the reaper drowses in the second, to the sunset bloom of the third. The fourth structural movement is one of imagery, from the tactile and kinesthetic images of moss-covered trees, swelling fruits, and overflowing honey of the first stanza, through the predominantly visual second stanza, which sees the personified figure of autumn stationed in different places and poses, to the auditory chorus of buzzing gnats, bleating lambs, chirping crickets, and birdsong that characterizes the final stanza. Of course, these senses are not only present in their respective stanzas, and the senses not emphasized are, if at least present also, the sweet taste of the hazelnut, the intoxicating fume of poppies. The fifth movement concerns the allegorical figure of Autumn, who is only implicit in the first stanza, but rises to visual presence throughout the second stanza, only to become effaced again in the, th the third stanza. Another way to describe this final large movement is population, who or what inhabits each stanza. The first is inhabited by fruit, the second by the figure of autumn, and the third by the animals. Yet within each of these large movements, Wendler notes, there are puzzling sub-motions. We will see some of these as we go through the poem. These sub-motions complicate any interpretation of the poem simply in terms of its broad movements, although they do not negate these movements. One of the first things we might notice about the poem as a whole is its privacy, or the intimacy between the poet and his goddess. This is quite different from the other odes, with the language contend to the liturgical, which is a public rather than a private language. In the Ode to Psyche, for example, the poet purports to sing the goddess' secrets 
into her own soft conscious ear, suggestive of private intimacy. But the liturgical language belies this. O oh, goddess, hear these tuneless numbers rung by sweet enforcement and remembrance dear. Here, on the other hand, there is none of this. When the poet says of the songs of spring, think not of them. It is as though only he and his goddess were present. The poet is so unconscious of his reader that we lose our identity and become him. As Wendler remarks, the autumn ode is private and flows between poet and season, and we are absorbed in its flow. The main constitutive trope of the ode is enumeration, the trope of plenitude. The most obvious example of this is in the three major lists of fruit and flowers, of apparitions of the goddess, and of the songs of animals. This is different from the trope of reiteration we saw in Nightingale, which is about inner intensity, expressing the same idea in many different ways, regardless of whether these clash. Enumeration is about exterior plenitude and involves fine discriminations. Each item of the list is meaningfully different. We'll see an example of this in a minute when Keats enumerates the various kinds of ripeness. But there are other ways beyond the lists that this trope of plenitude is present. We see it in simple doublings, mist and mellow fruitfulness, load and bless. And we see it in seemingly gratuitous detail, the mossed cottage trees, the full-grown lambs. We see it in the repetition of words, for example, the word fruit in the first stanza, and in the alternation of particular with general, to bend with apples the mossed cottage trees, and fill all fruit with ripeness to the core. Venla suggests a second major trope, concatenation, the way the images are stationed and interlinked. This goes to the heart of Keats' breakthrough in this poem, the way he infuses sensation with thought. We will return to this later, after first seeing it at work throughout the poem. We'll now turn to the first stanza of the poem. As I mentioned above, this stanza is set in late summer or early autumn, is focused on the farm's central cottage and its immediate surroundings, takes place in the morning, is full of tactile and kinesthetic sensuous descriptions, and is populated mainly by flowers and fruit. In the opening lines we have an image of autumn, or mists and mellow fruitfulness, in relationship with the maturing sun, conspiring with him how to load and bless the earth with fruits. This is, essentially, the image of a sky or sun god impregnating the earth, a primordial mythological motif. In creating this image, Keats draws on Milton's Paradise Lost. Here are a couple of passages in particular that Wendler highlights. The earth, though in comparison of heaven so small, not glistening, may of solid good contain more plenty than the sun that barren shines, whose virtue on itself works no effect but in the fruitful earth. There first received his beams in active house, their vigor find. The underlined words are Keats' own underlining in his copy of the book, suggesting the passage was significant to him. Another passage, more directly sexual, As Jupiter on Juno smiles when he impregnates the clouds that shed May flowers. Venler maintains that the phrase used in Keats' poem of the relationship between sun and season, namely that she is the sun's close bosom friend, Venler maintains that this is a euphemism for more than merely friendly relations. As she puts it, She all mists and mellow fruitfulness, and he, the maturing agent, conspire together, he breathing warmth, she moisture. In this allowing of the lower sense of sexuality into his poem, Keats gives full credence to the sexual origin of all teemings, those of art as well as those of nature. But as she goes on to say, the sexuality at the beginning of the poem is peaceful and healthy, no longer containing the hectic strain and pathos of the Ode on Melancholy, or his haunting poem La Belle Dame Sans Merci, The Beautiful Lady Without Mercy. 
Note that none of this is overtly stated. Keats does not explicitly evoke the god Apollo or offer a comment on the sexual origins of teemings, and yet the qualities and conjunction of these two personalities do suggest this. We begin to see in this stanza how Keats philosophizes with sensation. In enumerating the fruits of the season, he is not merely reiterating for the sake of intensity, as in the Ode on, to a Nightingale, but is making fine distinctions. In this particular case, he is enumerating all the different things that ripeness can mean. We first encounter the fruit loading and blessing the vines, and the apples bending the cottage trees. Ripeness here is a kind of adornment, in Wendler's words, a possession, a solace, and a welcome burden. In the next image, ripeness is repletion, an emptiness being filled to the core. Next, ripeness is expansion, the swelling of the gourd. Next, it is the introduction of something new inside, the sweet kernel of the hazel shell, what Wendler calls a gland-like swelling, almost representing the adolescence of fruit. Next, it is multiplicity, more and still more later flowers for the bees. It is then teleological, the abundance of flowers are for the bees. It is, at last, production beyond containment, the cells of the honeycomb overflow. In all of this propositional, philosophical or technical language is absent, and yet we get a wonderful sense not only of the variety of fruit, but of the variety of ways to be ripe, of the meanings of ripeness. Keats achieves this by by finding for every analytic relation of ripeness that he perceives an appropriate synthesis of verbs and nouns and their appropriate syntactic relation. We see an example of a submotion at work at the end of the stanza, going against the large structural movement of the progression of the season. It is that the bee's harvest of honey from the flowers comes last, after the ripening of fruit. But based on the overall movement, it should come first, as the fruit comes after the flower. We even hear that summer has or brimmed their clammy cells, and this poem to autumn seems to look back to the season that preceded it. This reveals the submotion or undertow of nostalgia at work in the ode. We see it too in the reference to the songs of spring and the hint at spring lambs in the third stanza. There is an additional reason why the flower harvest of the bees was placed last in the stanza. Many of the verbs used to describe the actions of autumn have a natural terminus. Loading ends in overloading, bending ends in breaking, filling ends in overflowing, swelling ends in bursting, and plumping ends in splitting. Of course, all the fruits will be harvested before the overripeness which is their natural destiny. So such endings are generally not depicted. But this profusion of verbs builds up a certain strain, which Keats relieves at last by letting one process run to its natural conclusion in the overbrimming of honey. For summer has or brimmed their clammy cells. The second stanza is set in the middle of autumn. During the harvest, amid the more outlying grain fields of the farm, in the heat of the day. It is predominantly visual, and is primarily inhabited by the allegorical figure of autumn. Though she was only implicit in the first stanza, as the addressee of the ode and the hidden agent of fruitfulness, in the second stanza the figure of autumn comes into full visible presence. We find her in the characteristic places and poses of harvesting, and yet it is she who is being harvested. We see a direct hint, hint at this as she sits careless on the granary floor. It is her own hair, not the grain, that is winnowed by the wind. Wendler reads a less direct hint in the closing image of the cider press and its last oozings, which are her lifeblood, not just the crushed apples. This is why she is strangely inactive, sitting careless rather than threshing or winnowing, asleep in the midst of her reaping, carrying the gleanings but not actively gleaning, and patiently watching the last oozings of the cider press rather than operating it. 
Keats is determined on an agricultural harvest, the work of humans with and upon the natural world. More on this later. In this stanza, therefore, Autumn acquiesces in, but does not enact, her own dissolution. The figure of Autumn is complex, though, representing at once nature and ourselves. Although on one level she represents nature acted upon, and so does not take active part in her own undoing, on another level, as a human figure, she represents human action upon nature, the agricultural harvest. This is a key to understanding another submotion in the poem, which again complicates the progression of the season. The order of a harvest should be reaping, gleaning, and threshing, but the order in the poem is threshing, reaping, and gleaning. There are at least two reasons for this, which I have summarized on the slide. The first charts a movement of diminution. Threshing is placed first because the hair soft lifted by the winnowing wind is still fully intact, but the furrow is half reaped. The grain is fully cut, and even the gleanings gathered borne on the head. And then finally the apples are crushed beyond recognition in the cider press, the essence extracted. With each stage there is a reduction, which induces a nostalgia for spring and ignites the question that begins the final stanza. But on another level, the harvest stages are arranged this way because they track the relationship of forces, that of nature and that of cultivating, harvesting mankind. In the first scene on the granary floor, these forces are in balance. The scene suggests equanimity, tranquility, stability, but the second scene, where the figure dozes from the fume of poppies, suggests the forces of nature have momentarily overbalanced the forces of mankind. In the next scene, humanity emerges dominant again, walking steady, laden with cut grain over the subject brook. Finally, in the last scene of the cider press, crushing the apples to essence, the forces of nature are completely subdued. But note that even here, the apples ooze, they do not spurt, they acquiesce to a certain degree to their own destruction. In these passages, Keats gives the resistances of nature their due, yet human-inflicted destruction and transubstantiation are victorious. The third stanza is set in late autumn, on the verge of winter, and reaches to the very boundaries of the farm and of the world. It takes place in the evening, at sunset, is primarily auditory, and is inhabited by all the creatures that lend their voices to it. Wendler reads the opening lines as a dialogue between the poet and his goddess of the season. Where are the songs of spring? He asks her in his nostalgia. Ay, where are they? She sighs back in dejection or grief. The poet catches himself, is sorry for his question. Think not of them, he reassures her. Thou hast thy music too. The songs of autumn seem to come from every direction, from the very boundaries of the farm. The river and hills are natural boundaries of a farm, and hedgerows were planted where natural boundaries were lacking. And yet, in another sub-motion of the poem, complicating the gradual expansion of scope that we've seen since the poem began with the central thatched cottage, in a complication of this overall motion, the poet is strangely stationary in the stanza. In the second stanza, we have a sense that he actually went out to the fields to see the figure of Autumn in her various postures. Sometimes whoever seeks abroad may find thee. Yet in the final stanza, it is the sounds that come to him. From hilly born, from a garden croft. As Wendler remarks, the sounds converge toward him, creating a centripetal submotion, opposing the powerful centrifugal motion of the stanza as it goes about its work, of establishing the outlying boundaries of the farm. This is from the letter I referred to in the introduction, where Keats mentions exactly when he composed this ode. Here is the relevant passage. How beautiful the season is now! How fine the air! A temperate sharpness about it, really without joking, chaste weather, Diane skies. I never liked stubble fields as much as now, I better than the chilly green of the spring, somehow a stubble plain looks warm, in the same way that some pictures look warm. This struck me so much in my Sunday's walk that I composed upon it. 
The stubble plains that Keats saw on that Sunday walk are therefore the originating image of the whole poem. Wendler remarks, The whole poem, to my mind, is uttered from the stubble plains, and its tones, even of greatest celebration, are, I think, intelligible only when they are heard as notes issuing from deprivation. Despite their outwardly warm appearance, these fields stripped of wheat are clearly evocative of winter, emptiness, absence, and death. The ode can be read from the perspective of the encounter with the stubble plains. In this reading, the first two stanzas are attempts to fill this emptiness and repair this lack. The first stanza fills it with the thatched cottage and abundance of growing fruit from earlier in the season. The second stanza fills it with the personified figure of autumn, that is, with a spirit of providence and care. Both of these attempts ultimately fail in face of the obdurate reality of the declining season. The third stanza returns to this reality, allowing the stubble plains to be just as they are, but within this broad approach there are two separate emphases. The first is tinged with pathos. With the nostalgia and sadness of the departing season and soft dying day, just as the scene itself is tinged with the rosy bloom of the setting sun. The initial animals mentioned have a somewhat infantile character. The gnats are small and they mourn. The full-grown lambs are essentially sheep. Wendler comments that calling them full-grown lambs is akin to calling adult humans full-grown infants. And they bleat, as a young lamb would bleat for its mother. This evokes a poem by Shakespeare, Sonnet 97, that talks about the teeming autumn, big with rich increase. Addressed to his beloved, the latter part of the poem runs like this. Yet this abundant issue seemed to me but hope of orphans and unfathered fruit, for summer and his pleasures wait on thee, and thou away the very birds are mute, or if they sing tis with so dull a cheer that leaves look pale, dreading the winter's near. There are multiple resonances and significant contrasts between this and Keats' poem, but an important one is the orphans. The creatures of the last stanza of the ode can be seen as orphans mourning for a dead mother as the season passes away. But there is another emphasis, which is more fresh, objective and clear, an approach that refuses pathos and instead portrays just what is present. Following the description of the gnats and lambs, Keats, in Wendler's words, pulls himself up short with an enormous effort of will, and describes the creatures just as they are in the simple phrase, hedge crickets sing. For the final two species, too, the descriptions are relatively simple and accurate. Now with treble soft the red breast whistles from a garden croft, and gathering swallows twitter in the skies. Although here a very subtle note of pathos is allowed back in, the soft treble of the red breast, perhaps being associated with the soft high voice of a child singer, and the swallows gathering, perhaps, for their winter migration. Nevertheless, the impression of the final lines leaves us with, in Wendler's words, the impression of the sobriety of the actual. And this is one of the greatest achievements of the poem. In the very last line, Keats finds, after experimenting with many others, his perfected word for poetic utterance, gathering swallows Twitter in the skies. Twitter certainly doesn't seem like a very glorious term for what poets do, but in selecting this, Wendler argues, Keats comes to finally renounce his restorative hopes of the first two stanzas and of most of his previous odes. Poetry cannot really restore anything, and it cannot reproduce or reduplicate the world. It is not simply mimetic as it was in Psyche, nor is it a picture like the Grecian urn, though it is not unrelated to reality either, an escape from it as it was in Nightingale. It is instead, like the twittering of the swallows, a thin thread of sound rising and falling in obedience to its governing rhythms. This realistic deflation of the expectations for poetry goes hand in hand with the sobriety of the actual that comes through in the final lines, as the poet lifts himself above pathos and attends with his twittering verse to just what is happening at this time. Then he puts it more beautifully. In the last moment of the ode, both loss and its compensatory projections, 
whether in ripening fruit, in peopled landscape, or in rosy bloom, are forgotten in an annihilation of subjectivity and a pure immersion in the actual. And with this, the poet's gaze rises from the bare landscape of approaching winter to the final boundary, the sky. In Wendler's words, the glance that rises to the skies in the last line, the swallow's twitter in, not from the skies, has lifted itself away from the panorama of the land and its missing riches, and is purged of self-referential pathos and nostalgia for the past. The ode has floated free of its occasion, and ends poised in the sound of song sufficient unto itself. Having gone through the poem stanza by stanza, I'll now summarize some of its overall meanings as Wendler sees them. On one level, the ode is a metaphor for human life, constant process, initial growth and fruitfulness ultimately leading to a bleak, wintry end. But there is an aspect of the metaphor that Keats appears to deliberately avoid, the reassuring fact of the cyclicality of the seasons. Autumn will end in winter, yes, but winter itself will lead to a new spring. Life will begin again. From this we might derive some hope in an afterlife. Death is not the end. But this is not what Keats appeared to believe, and is not in any case an obvious conclusion we can draw nowadays from our understanding of nature and human existence. While the dying autumn will eventually lead to a spring resurrection, when an individual human life ends, it simply ends. Therefore, Keats avoids any mention of spring except for the nostalgic, retrospective one at the beginning of the second stanza, which he then immediately dismisses. The other great image used in poems about the season is the joyful harvest celebration, which is also notably absent. The swallows gather in the skies, and though we can't be certain, we can conjecture they are gathering for their winter migration. Venler cites a phrase Keats used in a letter to his sister in 1817. They all vanish like swallows in October, suggesting he thinks of October swallows as annihilated beings. Of course, winter is not mentioned either. In fact, it is the only of the seasons not mentioned. But Wendler believes this is because, representing death, it is indescribable. She quotes the poet Robert Lowell, paraphrasing the philosopher Witt Wittgenstein, Death's not an event in life. It's not lived through. On this reading, the ode is devoid of any otherworldly consolation, while not devoid of either truth or beauty, and not ultimately despairing. In the bare stubble plains of the, o of the departing season, the ode to autumn, like most of the other odes, touches the absence at the heart of things. But its response to this absence is different than most of the other odes. In Psyche, the poet reduplicates the goddess's cult and shrine within his own mind in the hope that she will come to inhabit it. He tries to repair absence with art. In Nightingale, he uses the pure sensuous sound of music to escape for a time from the harsh realities of life, but returns to them in the end when he awakes from his reverie, as he inevitably must. In Grecian Urn, he senses the finality of death and the death deathliness of art. In the little town at the origin of the sacrificial procession, now forever silent and empty, he does not evade this reality, though neither does he fully embrace it or integrate it. Only in the Ode on Melancholy does he actively seek it, and finds it in Melancholy's shrine, within the very Temple of Delight. These penultimate image, the penultimate image of that Ode is of bursting joyous grape against his palate fine, a marvellous image for affirming life and its intrinsic transience. But one cannot write an ode to an action, so he writes instead to a season, to that which is, like life, intrinsically transient. There is an absence at the heart of things. Life is an inexorable process. These two, of course, go together. In the Ode to Autumn, Keats finally affirms the reality of process, not in the forceful and strained quasi-heroic manner of melancholy, Though this strain is somewhat mitigated towards the end of that poem, I think the sense of it does remain. But, with the simple openness and equanimity of an autumn yielding abundance, people harvesting it, and the season drawing to a close, Venla summarizes Keats' achievement here. 
In singing a hymn to a season, he is worshipping beauty incorporating its own ending. Closely related to this, the poem fully recognises the sacrificial nature of life and art, which was previously hinted at but not fully embraced in the sacrificial procession and ode on a Grecian urn, and arguably overdone in the final image in the ode on melancholy, the poet willingly hung as a cloudy trophy on the walls of melancholy's shrine. The sense of the sacrificial pervades the ode to autumn without being overstrained. Life is inherently sacrificial because characterized by process and absence, but more than this, the good life is sacrificial because characterized by struggle, labor, pain, and the giving up of one thing for another. Likewise, art is sacrificial because of the demands it makes on the artist, but also because it transforms nature, life, and raw experience into something quite different, something somewhat artificial and social, with its own emphases and absences and rhythms, something like, in the case of poetry, the twittering of gathering swallows, a thin thread of sound rising and falling. For all these reasons, the poem represents the final ascent from childhood to adulthood, as the sound, as the chorus of creatures rises from the small mournful gnats and full-grown lambs to the crickets and the birds. In including the gnats and the lambs, and all that emotionally pertains to the late rosy bloom of the soft dying day, it gives full credence to the child who remains within every adult, and to the infant crying in the night at her mother's death. Venla continues, The great effort of will required to convert grief into something that can legitimately be called not wailing or mourning or bleating, but song, is at once the effort to rise from childhood to adulthood and the effort to assume the musical objectivity of the Orphic voice. This is not simply a poem about natural process, but about the inseparability of the domestic and the wild, the agricultural and the natural, as the wild, notably the closing choir, is the context for the domestic, and the agricultural the counterpart of the natural. Everywhere this is evident, the wind is the winnower, the human figure the winnowed, the natural poppies are found entwined with the cultivated corn, as noted before, the final subjugation of the apples in the cider press is not exactly involuntary. They ooze rather than spirit. It is as though the clouds paint the landscape with a rosy hue. The gnats are a choir. The wind lives and dies. The crickets sing, and the swallows are gathering, gathering together or gathering grain, what Venla calls the most elusive transfer of an agricultural word. Finally, the poem resolves one problem that had plagued the other odes. What is art? And in particular, what is poetic or lyric art? Is it mimesis, reduplication or copying, as in Psyche? Or is it completely unrelated to real life, as it seems to be in Nightingale? How exactly does it relate to the world that we actually live in, as Grecian Urn asks? In the final image of twittering birds as metaphor po for poetic speech, in the renunciation of attempts to repair lack in the world with art, in the images of harvest that the poem is replete with, and in many other hints, Venla sees an implicit theory of art. This theory rejects the idea that the criterion of poetic art should be strict representational truth. Instead, two criteria are proposed. The first is that poetry should derive from life, as juice derives from apples and grain derives from corn. There is this crucial relation, though not one of simple copying, some, something more like extraction of essence or transubstantiation. The second criterion is that it be appropriate to its subject, as the song of the gnats, crickets and swallows are appropriate to the season of spring. This is not to say it must be literally accurate, but that a certain relevance, resonance, or fittedness with its subject is essential. Now we come to what makes the poem most brilliant, not just what it is about, but how it is written. 
It achieves the union of beauty and truth that had eluded Keats until this point. Given to sensuous description, but concerned about truth, how could he unite these? In Nightingale, he flees truth for the sake of beauty. In Grecian Urn, he turns toward truth, stripping his language of much sensuous description and filling the poem with propositional language to do so. How else to talk about truth except by propositions? And yet, that is the work of the philosopher or scientist, not of the poet. In the Ode on Melancholy, he finds a sensuous image that expresses truth, the strenuous tongue that can burst joy's grape against the palate fine. But even here, the abstraction joy haunts the image and frustrates his attempt. Only in To Autumn does he find a way to express truths purely through sensuous description, and he does this by the way he stations his words and verbal images in relation to each other. This is how we can read the various different types of ripeness, can sense the inexorable progress of the season, and can feel the different responses to absence and death. These things are not overtly stated, but are present nonetheless, and this is arguably precisely what makes for really excellent poetry. The poem is almost wholly without explicit references, announcements, or abstract vocabulary. And yet, says Wendler, there is no form, whether syntactic, grammatical, rhetorical, or descriptive, in the ode, which is not symbolic, not formally meaningful. In my video on the Ode to a Nightingale, I mentioned a letter Keats wrote, some, wrote in which he praised Shakespeare's sonnets. I never found so many beauties in the sonnets. They seem to be full of fine things said unintentionally, in the intensity of working out conceits. As an example of this, he quotes from Sonnet 12, which, by the way, is more directly pertinent to Keats' poem to Autumn. When lofty trees I see barren of leaves, which erst from heat did canopy the herd, and summer's green all girded up in sheaves, borne on the bear with white and bristly beard. This is part of a developing poetic conceit, and toward the end of the poem, Shakespeare states the meaning of it, that sweets and beauties do themselves forsake, and die as fast as they see others grow, and nothing gainst time's scythe can make defence. But Keats forbears to explain the interwoven conceits or images in the Ode to Autumn. It is as though he took what he admired in Shakespeare's sonnets to the extreme, stripping away all explanation and leaving only the conceits. As Wendler says, he was daring enough to let the working out of the conceit speak entirely for itself. Sensation could express thought without an intellectual commentary. In Wendler's eyes, this is Keats' great breakthrough in this ode. It meant that sensation and thought were not two things, but one, providing one wrote of articulated sensation, that beauty and truth were not two things, but one, providing one had stationed beauty truly. Sensation, like thought, has structure, and this structure is expressive. It seems to me that poetry relies deeply on this expressive, structured sensation. Keats brings this to perfection in his final ode. In the odes he created before this, Keats was exploring the question, what is the poetic art? This drove his experiments with different senses and different arts. Is it like the natural song of a nightingale, or the eternal visual forms of a Grecian urn? In the Ode to Autumn, he realizes that, in its own unique way, lyric poetry embraces all of the senses and comes to the great discovery that lyric makes sense by giving a natural sensual topography to the algebra of thought. The poem is written in such a way as to seamlessly combine unison and diversity. There is unison within the three lists of parallel phenomena, the fruit, the appearances of the figure, and the creatures. Yet at the same time, each particular thing is distinctly itself. All the vegetation is compelled by the season in parallel to grow, but one is a vine being loaded with fruit, another is a tree being bent with apples, another a swelling gourd, another a shell being plumped with a sweet kernel. Likewise, all the creatures are compelled in parallel to utterance, but one mourns, another bleats, another sings, another whistles. There is order, measure, necessity, but within this, 
multiplicity, changefulness, and idiosyncrasy. This multiplicity and unity characterizes the poem in another and deeper way. The ode, says Wendler, is multiple in the number of polyphonic effects, each pointing in a slightly different direction or even contradictory direction, which it can simultaneously sustain. Our reading of the poem will be different depending on the weight we give each of its many organizing motions in a particular reading, none of which are necessarily false. In one particular reading, the motion of decline may predominate. In another time, the motion of expansion. Sometimes creativity will predominate, sometimes sacrifice, sometimes plenitude, sometimes necessity. This is not arbitrary. They are all there, and not just anything can be read into the poem. Keats's previous poems have often been characterized by a movement of deepening intensity followed by a moment of desolation. Think of the Ode to a Nightingale with its intensifying aesthetic trance followed by its forlorn awakening to reality. This movement is absent from the Ode to Autumn. Instead there is, as Wendler puts it, a rhythm of a steady rising and setting concomitant with rhythms of expansion and etherealization. Without denying the value of dream, Keats no longer dreads the return to waking reality. He knows the proper use of both and the necessity of sacrifice. I'll leave you with this final quote. The single most important discovery of the poem is that the passing from dreaming to waking is the moment not of void, but of store and of utterance. Without the scythe and the cider press, there would be no grain and no oozings and no impetus to listen to the autumn voices.